My guest today is Virginia McKenna, who acted in the film Born Free, that is celebrating 50 years this year. And I watched that film and I sang the song Born Free as a kid in India. <laughs> oh, I think that's the most wonderful story. I'd not heard that before, that it was popular in India. Um, you might be interested to know that as far as the song's concerned, you know, the original song with Matt Monroe, it's now been re-recorded and rearranged with a wonderful Queen musician, Brian May. He's done a, a whole new arrangement, and Gary Ellis, the fabulous singer, uh, has done a new recording with him. So the song lives on as well, which is fantastic. Can you sing a few bars? Oh, no, don't, don't ask me to sing. <laughs> <laughs> well, your mom was a piano teacher, so you probably have a singing voice. Can you just sing a couple of uh, uh, oh. lines from the song? Oh, my God. Well, my goodness, I've never been asked to sing this song before, so everyone can put some cotton wool in their ears while I do my best. Born free, as free as the wind blows, as free as the grass grows, born free to follow your heart. You see, I can't even get down that. Oh, dear. Live free where no walls yeah, divide. Right. Yeah. So what did that song mean to you when you were shooting the film who came up with that song? Well, you might be interested also to know that uh, the song was not um, played uh, during the premiere. The, the producers, for some mystifying reason, didn't think it was that wonderful or didn't want it. And we never understood it. But there was an outcry. And so the f song was then, following the premiere, was then put into the, into the soundtrack. Mm. And Matt Monroe, of course, made the most enormous hit with the song and well deserved. He sang it divinely, I thought. Mm. So, because the film is 50 years old, take us back to the shooting of the film, the making of the film in Africa. And, you know, did you have one uh, line uh, acting as Elsa or did you have multiple lines? Talk to us about the making of the film, which is about this lion, often lion cub, that the couple that you play, you and your husband played the couple, you bring up this cub and then very reluctantly have to let it go into the wild. Yes, well, let me start at the end and go, then go back to the beginning because I just want to say something about your last comment, which is that they didn't reluctantly let her go back into the wild because when, they, when George Adamson, who was then a game warden, shot the mother of three little cubs and then they found uh, the three little cubs in a rock, of course, and they had to rescue them. And he took the little cubs back to Joy, who then reared them. Um, they decided that one little cub, the, the cub that they chose and called Elsa, they were going to return Elsa to the wild and teach her to be a wild free lioness because they did not believe in any of the animals being in captivity. Unfortunately, they weren't allowed to keep all three, and so the other two went to Rotterdam Zoo in Holland. But Elsa was taught by the Adamsons to hunt, to look after herself. She mated with a wild lion, had her own three cubs. So it was the most fantastic success. As far as um, making the film was concerned, it was perhaps a little more complicated because when we were asked to do the film, uh, it was 1964, um, we were told it was quite easy, actually, to be with the lions. You know, they were just big pussycats and all would be fine. And we weren't quite sure if that was accurate. We didn't know very much about lions, of course. Uh, we learnt quite, quite a bit going out on the boat to, to Mombasa, read lots of books, but no book can really tell you everything. It was when we actually met the two lionesses they'd chosen for us to work with, which had come from a circus in Holland. They were trained lionesses, and they were about nine and ten years old, so they were not tiny animals. Um, we realized when we went home in the car every night from working with them all day with their trainer in the compound that it was going to be very difficult to make this film in a natural way because we couldn't behave naturally with the animals. They were trained and only used to doing things on command. And in a way, that was not what the story of Born Free is about. It's about a natural relationship. One day, when my husband Bill went in to do his uh, hour of so-called training with Astra the lioness and, and Monica the trainer, 
uh, Astra was in a very bad temper, and um, he, she tried to get at Bill, and he managed to get out of the enclosure. And the producers who were watching um, were obviously very upset and nervous seeing this, and they decided to uh, remove both the lanises from any close work at all. And so then we had none. Bit by bit, from all over the place, came the most fantastic cast of lands, and we worked closely with about five. And they were none of them were trained. Some of them had been used to being with human beings at some point in their lives, when they were small, or sometimes when they e were even a little older, like for 14 months or so. And through George Adamson, and only through him, were we able to learn about the nature of lands how to become friendly with them, how to get them to trust us, how to read their body language, how to read the signals that they would give us if they were pleased, if they were grumpy, if they were lonely, whatever, to learn their body language. And that was the secret of our safety, was to anticipate what might happen. And it's only when sometimes we were obliged to work a bit longer than we should have because we could sense the lands were getting fed up, it's only then they became rough sometimes and uh, we might get knocked around not well, knocked over or something but truly that's the only way this story could have been told and that's why I think maybe it's lasted such a long time because what you saw was true the relationship was real it wasn't an acted relationship it was a real one and thanks to George and only George we were able to do that what a fantastic story. I watched the film again in preparation for the interview. And the first thing that struck me is how natural both you and your husband were with the lions. It was hard to believe that you had five lions. You mentioned that uh, Mr. Adamson uh, shared tips on how to be uh, comfortable around lions. I am deathly afraid of animals. Can animals sense your fear? What is the secret for working around with animals? Well, I'm not really an expert on, uh, on, on working with animals. Uh, really, lions are the only wild animals I've... Well, except there was a ele little elephant once. But um, in a way, lions, because it took 10 months to do the film. Um, George didn't actually give us tips. How we learned was watching him. We learned through watching his behavior, and we tried to emulate his behavior and learn from that. He wasn't a person who said, now don't do this or do do that. It wasn't like that at all. It was just the way he was and was truly the best way is learning through understanding and watching, not being told. You know, it wasn't written down in a book. It was just the way he was, and we picked up all his sensitivity and his deep understanding of what makes animal, lions in particular um, afraid, nervous, trusting, relaxed, on edge, fed up, all the different emotions that we humans have as well. But you learn through the body language of the lion and therefore could anticipate once you saw a change in their ear position or, or whatever, or the way they were looking. And George said to us once, don't think because the lion is looking straight ahead that it can't see you over there. It sees absolutely everything. So that was a very important lesson because one's deluded sometimes thinking, oh, I'm is, is looking over there so I can do something over here. Don't do that. Don't take the, the risk. Peripheral vision is Absolutely, strong. yeah. Oh. And of course, sensitivity to, to sound and also the sensitivity to, to distraction, to being distracted because one of the reasons that the crew of the film were ca in cages and the camera was in a cage was that only f very, very few people were outside free with the lion because the, it was very important that the lion was concentrating on the two people playing George and Joy. That was the purpose of the whole story. So as few people as possible, George, uh, a couple of people, uh, safety people, um, apart from that, everyone was in cages. Mm. and. Um, Really, it was an unforgettable time of our lives and, of course, carried on into different areas of our life to this day. What drew you and your husband in making the film and how did the film change you? Well, my husband, Bill, and I were always very keen 
uh, to go on an, ad an adventure. We, we love challenges and we love doing something new and exciting. And this seemed probably the most new and exciting thing we'd ever been asked to do. So we immediately said yes. In fact, we, when they said, uh, we met the producers for tea in a hotel in London. And they said, we would like you to play George and Joy. Would you do it? And we just said yes. Simultaneously, we just said yes. And when we came out, we couldn't believe what we'd done. We were so excited. It was fantastic. And uh, we had three children at the time. My eldest son, Will, was five and uh, now is president of the Born Free Foundation, and which we started together 32 years ago. And, um, and our other children, uh, my daughter Louise and son Justin, they were much tinier. There's three of us and our nanny and the two of us. Off we went by boat from London to Mombasa for 10 months and had a house in the bush. And it changed all our lives, really, in, in different ways. After the film? Well, after the film, um, my husband's work changed virtually immediately because he said, the only thing I really want to do is to tell the story of what happened to the lands that were used in the film. Out of over 20, I think there were 22, 23 animals, uh, only three were obtained by us and the Adamsons to be returned to the wild in Meru National Park in, in uh, Kenya. And um, boy and girl, the two mascots from the Scots Guards Regiment, and um, a male called Ugas, who lived in the Nairobi orphanage. And luckily we got those three, but all the others came to zoos and safari parks, not only in the UK, but here in America too, I think. So in a way that planted the seed of, of our feelings about wild animals in captivity. It started then, but it didn't come to the boil, as it were, until uh, 1983, when an elephant that we'd worked with in one of Bill's films, Poli uh, Poli, which means slowly, slowly, as you know in Swahili, uh, we made a film in 1968 in Kenya called An Elephant Called Slowly. And um, she'd been caught already by the Kenya government of those days as a gift to London Zoo. And when we'd finished filming for six weeks with her, uh, we asked if we could buy her so that we could give her to Daphne and David Sheldrake, the famous Sheldricks um, who uh, lived in Savo. He was chief senior game warden. And uh, she rescued and looked after orphaned animals. And she had two young elephants. And we wanted Poli Poli to join them because she loved them so much and one day go back to the wild, which was what Daphne was doing. And we were told, yes, that we could do that, but they'd have to capture another baby. And, of course, we know what that means to the elephant family in the wild. Absolutely traumatic and terrible. So we said, no, we couldn't agree to that. So she came to the zoo. And then we heard from Daphne that things weren't good, that possibly Poli Poli was going to be destroyed and put down. And uh, could we do something? So we immediately got going. And um, eventually the zoo said they would send her to Whipsnade, their country zoo, where there was a little group of elephants, because she was all by herself in London Zoo, which is torture for an elephant. And um, unfortunately... Why, why is it torture? Because elephants are family people. Elephants live in groups. They look after their young, their aunties, their grannies. They look after everyone the whole of their lives. So for a female elephant to be solitary uh, results usually in very abnormal behavior patterns. And you can tell with the swaying or head swinging or the foot crossing, all sorts of symptoms that, signs that that all is not well. And uh, she was definitely uh, portraying some of these uh, things. So anyway, they said they'd send her to Whipsnade, but sadly um, she'd been standing too long in the crate. She collapsed, hurt a leg. And so when they examined it and she couldn't get up, they said, Oh, she's lost the will to live, and they destroyed her. And it was her death that was the birth of our charity, then called Suchek, where we looked into the problems, and there are many that captive wild animals face in zoos and circuses. The death of Poli Poli resulted in the birth of the open... Uh, uh, the Suchek. Sujek, which, is, which became the Born Free Foundation. Tell us about the Born Free Foundation, and looking back... How has the conservation movement changed over the years, in the last 50 years? And I also want to, because we have very few minutes left, also the killing of that 
uh, of Cecil in South Africa by the American dentist, you know, in this day and age? Well, um, I think the conservation, uh, the awareness of conservation, the awareness of the situation for wild animals in captivity is very much more in the public mind now than it was all those years ago. You know, we went to the zoo for a good day out, fun, and all the rest of it. I don't think people go all together with that frame of mind anymore. I think they go with a much more alert frame of mind, critical viewpoint. Um, you know, you can do the simplest things. You can say, has the animal got shade? Can it behave naturally in any way? Has it got companions if it should? All sorts of simple questions that most people can answer. Um, so I think the awareness of that is has increased enormously. A lot more criticism and awareness about wild animals in captivity where they should never be, in my view. Um, and as far as Cecil and, and the sport hunting, so-called, is concerned, um, I believe it's, it's quite obscene, actually, that anyone should want to kill a beautiful wild creature to, to show off a trophy on, the, on the, the head on the wall or the rug on the floor, to me, is absolutely disgraceful that anyone in this day and age should find joy, amusement, um, pride in doing anything so shameful. And unfortunately, I, even though Cecil has become almost like a symbol like Elsa was for a different reason, Cecil is now this icon for all of us who are, are, are totally opposed to the hunting of wild creatures for fun and sport. Um, We've, we mustn't let that, that movement die because things do fade away. You know, people go on to other matters. We mustn't let that go because it is one of the most disgraceful and shameful things uh, that we are passing on to our children to say, oh, it's fine to do that. Come on. We know that 50 years ago there were about 100,000 lions in Africa. There may be 20,000 now. In 50 years, as they're going and we're killing some for fun. You know, it's shameful and disgraceful. As a kid, did you have any pets and you also spent time in South Africa? Or did you get acquainted with wild animals when you were in uh, South Africa? Oh, I had, uh, we had uh, animals at home all my life, actually. My father was very fond of, of having animals around the house. And when we were in South Africa, we always had dogs. Um, and my first lions, actually, I was taken by a school friend and her family in South Africa to Kruger for the weekend camping and I saw my first wild lions there, I have never forgotten it. Because the contrast between seeing those two wild lions sitting under a tree and being taken by my father to London Zoo when I must have been about six or five or six and going into the lion house at London Zoo where these magnificent creatures were in cages. There was no outdoor area in those days and they were just pacing up and down this concrete hell and the clanging of the outside door of steel. It was so appalling. Even as a child, I remember thinking, I don't think I like this. I'd like to leave this place. Whereas seeing them in the wild, you just think, may they live here always. This is where they should be. Yes, I can't but help notice a little ribbon you're wearing. With uh, oh. <laughs> what, what is that for? Well, this is the Born Free emblem. It's Elsa the Lioness, because it, the lands carrying on from the Adamsons, the legacy that they left us, and um, and the way, in our own way, we've tried to keep that alive, uh, both the captive issue and the conservation issue, which my son Will is very strong at and strong with, and he leads all our projects in, in Meru now. Um, this is our little symbol, um, and I'm glad you've noticed it, actually. I think it's quite sweet and quite not too pushy, but nevertheless, it's it's got a character, hasn't it? And that's what we must never forget. Each lion and each animal has a character. You're not pushy. You're a very gracious lady. Thank you so much for your time. I wish I had more time to oh. talk, but thank you so much. And thank you for giving us a film that shows us what freedom means to wild animals. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a, such a pleasure to meet you. <laughs>